You can be seated. Open up this evening to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. We're going to be reading a, a large portion of this chapter. We're going to be jumping all around in this chapter, so I would encourage you to follow along as much as we're able. We're right in the middle of our examination of the Day of Atonement. It's called Yom Kippur. Remember, Yom is day, Kippur is atonement, so there's nothing mystical about Yom Kippur in the name. This is not a feast. This is actually the only time of fasting that God actually commanded to be observed on an annual basis in Leviticus 23, 27, and also here at the end of Leviticus 16. Uh, not only were the people of Israel commanded to fast, but if you remember from last week, they were also strictly prohibited from work of any kind. Do not work at all on this day. There's one person who is permitted to work. We're going to talk about him today. It's the high priest. Other than that, everybody else is to remain still. The picture of salvation is very strong in that. If you remember... The work of atonement was to be done by someone else, in this case the high priest. And, and our labor, their labor, was not involved at all, just like salvation. Okay, There's, no, there's none of this, well, I have to do all of these things and then, then God will pick up the slack. No, God picks up all of it. Salvation is all of God, it's none of me. Uh, blood is essential in this, but sweat is forbidden. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's what we have here on this. As we're looking at kind of the picture of the Day of Atonement, looking forward, the blood, and we're going to talk about the blood here this evening, the blood is essential, but the sweat, even of the high priest, is, is not supposed to happen. Last week, we began looking at Leviticus 16, and we looked at the first two verses uh, and it's, uh, it's the detailed instructions for the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 starts with a reminder of the fate of those who attempt to approach God upon their own terms. If you look there in verse 1, it talks about the death of the two sons of Aaron. That's hearkening back to Leviticus 10, where it talks about Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire before the Lord, and the Lord struck them dead. Um... The, the context of Leviticus 10 would, would lead us to believe that they were probably drunk when they did this. And it's entirely possible that Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, also made an attempt to get into the Holy of Holies. We don't, we don't know that, but the context and the, the warnings that God issued right after Nadab and Abihu were struck down, God said, hey, don't drink before you do this leading us to believe perhaps they were drunk when they did it. So the same is said for their entering of the Holy of Holies. The, the point was made very strongly. Two dead boys, the point was made, you only approach God on his terms. This isn't something that you get to customize. God has given very specific instructions. And this evening we're going to look at the, the rest of Leviticus 16, and we're going to see the divine guidelines for the Day of Atonement. We start off with the preparation in verse 3. Thus shall Aaron... Okay, now in this chapter, it is Aaron. But in future days, it's going to be just the high priest. It would be Zadok at a time, it would be Abiathar at another time. It, lots of different men have done this, but at this time, it's Aaron, the high priest. <coughs> Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He's coming up to the tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle is a box-shaped tent. It's 45 feet long, it's 15 feet wide, and it's 15 feet high. It's constructed inside. It has two rooms, two chambers. The first one that you come into as you, when you go into the door, uh, you come into, it's called the holy place. The holy place is where the majority of the furniture is. You have the lampstand, you have the table of showbread, and then back in the back of this, this first room, you have the altar of incense. So imagine with me, it's, it's a dark place, 
and it's got smoke because you have not only the smoke off of the lampstand, but you also have an incense altar. There's not a lot of ventilation in this place. At the back of the holy place is a curtain, or we would call it a veil. The veil was very ornate, and it, had, uh, it was woven very, very thick, and it had uh, gold woven into it. It had the images of two cherubim on it, and they, they reached across uh, in, in the curtain. And on the other side of the curtain was a 15 by 15 by 15 chamber. And it is called the Holy of Holies, and it has one thing inside of it. What's inside? The Ark of the Covenant. That's it. The only piece of furniture. No, no source of light is in there. It's a dark place where you have the Ark of the Covenant. And this innermost chamber, the Holy of Holies, is Aaron's destination on the Day of Atonement. Look at verse 4. We're looking at the preparation. This is just as we're kind of gearing up for it. He says, he, speaking of Aaron, shall put on the holy linen coat. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen miter shall, be, shall, shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. These garments are different from what he wore most days. Most days, you can find in Exodus 28, verses 1 to 43, a very long chapter that describes the ornate attire of the priest. It's not this. This is special clothing that is kept in the holy place. And so Aaron goes in, he washes himself, kind of a ceremonial bath. Then he puts on this, this linen clothing. You remember from last week, we looked in Ezekiel 44. Why linen? You don't sweat in linen. You don't sweat in linen. That's important. Okay, Keeping the picture of it's not the sweat of man, it's blood that brings atonement. Aaron wears these, and, and those clothes are, are just worn on this day, and they're primarily worn within the tabernacle. He'll come out in them for one portion of the day, and we'll, we'll talk about it in just a moment. But this is not the, the typical, the blue over the white with the breastplate with the jewels on it and the kind of a very ornate headpiece that they would wear. That's not this. This is a, a linen bonnet, a linen garment. And Aaron is wearing this for this special day. Which brings us to the first sacrifice in verse, in verse 5. The first sacrifice is for the high priest. Look at it in verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering. Okay, we'll talk about those animals in a minute. Verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Here's the first sacrifice. It's for the high priest and his family. Why does the high priest need to offer a sacrifice for himself first? Because he's a priest. He's a sinner. <laughs> because he has sin that must first be dealt with. So he offers this bull, and he takes the blood of this bull, and, and we see what he does in verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar of the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, that is upon the testimony that he die not. Okay, here's the first trip in. The first trip into the holy place. Aaron goes, he takes this, this, this animal, this cow. He slaughters it. He collects the blood in a, in a bowl or a basin. And then on his first trip into the holy of holies, his first trip into that inner court, that inner chamber where the Ark of the Covenant is, he takes a sensor. The sensor would provide maybe a little bit of light, not much. But when it's really dark, you don't need just a ton of light. So he goes in, he's got this sensor, and he has his hands filled with incense. 
a very particular blend of incense. And you can read about it in the law. He takes this incense, and then he also has this bowl. So Aaron goes in with his hands full, okay? He goes into the holy place, and the first thing that he does is he puts the incense in the censer, okay? So it starts burning, and it's made to smoke. So it smokes a whole lot, and what it does is the smoke is going to partially hide. It's going to, to impair the vision of the high priest and prevent him from looking directly on the mercy seat. Why is that important? Who manifests his presence on the mercy seat? God. 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 Okay. And no man can look on the presence of God and live. And so he's, he's putting this on there and it's, it's going to smoke and it's going to the, the original smoke screen right here. It's being formed so that he it, it impairs his vision. Okay, Then he's going to take the blood. He's going to take this blood, and he's, verse 14, he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So he's got, he's got this bowl of blood, this basin of blood, sticks his finger in towards the east and kind of flicks the blood onto the mercy seat. Okay? Seven times. Why seven? Well, a lot of people who, who apply all sorts of, of probably bad theology to it. Seven is typically associated with completion in, in Scripture. So seven times he sprinkles the blood onto the mercy seat. Now the sin of the high priest has been atoned or covered, and he can proceed with atoning for the sins of everyone else. Okay? So we've done an awful lot of work, and we've just dealt with the sins of the high priest, his family. You following with me? When would this early in the wilderness uh, 40 years, did this all begin? Pretty quickly thereafter. Yeah. Because Aaron wouldn't have just been in the wilderness. I mean, he wouldn't have been yeah. part of that in Egypt. No, no it would have been Aaron, Aaron would have been Aaron was a man in Egypt, and so he would have been yeah. an older man at this point. Until Moses come into the picture, yeah. he wouldn't have been. He was, he was involved in this Fairly early on in the wilderness wanderings. Yeah. So the Ark of the Covenant would come into that at, about, at that time too. Moses got the plans for the Ark of the Covenant when he was receiving the Ten Commandments on Sinai. So shortly there, he came down from there and they started the process of building all of this stuff. Yes, sir. So what would the current Jews, there's no temple for them to do this in, but current. Orthodox Jews, if the Orthodox Jews who do this, correct? For, for they would people. celebrate the Day of Atonement, but okay. it, not with animal sacrifice, because okay. they don't have the place to do it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so then it, how would they um, explain the silence of God over the last 2,500 years? Um, would that be because he doesn't or his manifestation in the temple is because there is no temple. That's what they would. They, yeah, they, they would. Be, if their their goal is, we need if we could just get the temple. Mm -hmm. For a long time, it was if we could just get to Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now they're in Israel. If we could just get the temple, then we can we can get this going again. And they have, I think I mentioned, they have everything set. It wouldn't take long if the if the dome of the rock was not where the temple was supposed to be. It would not take the Jews very long. To, to get four walls up. <laughs> Why They're pretty well they set. don't do it somewhere else? I mean, they did it in the wilderness for 40 years. That's the other thing I was thinking, too. Because, uh, because of the, it being the Temple Mount, is they're not interested in having the tabernacle. They, they want that spot because it's, it's, they want it like it's significant. Else. <laughs> yeah, it is true. Although, you know, before, <laughs> well, there is coming a day there will be a Jewish temple on that spot. So we're, we're coming up on it, and it, it could happen in our lifetime. So would they believe that once they have the temple, once they're able to do this exact, They'll get exactly it. the way it was, that God's spirit would then manifest again? Because they don't... Yeah, I don't know what they're t teaching on, you know, the, the presence of God, sure. but they would... Like, you know, there's not a high priest... Yeah. They would, they would have a high priest, and they, if, if Israel could have the temple, 
in 10 years, in 10 years, they'll be offering animals. They're you could just go this, on without the ark. We don't have it. It went on during the days of Jesus without the ark. Because they did, they were practicing the Day of Atonement, and the ark has been gone since the days of Jeremiah. And nobody knows where it is. Now, what about the veil? Is it going to be, will they have that veil there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, wow. you want to think, I, I was thinking just in this, and to, to go off on this just, just for a moment. We're going to talk about it in a few minutes, about the veil being torn. And you know the significance of the veil being torn. I know the significance of the veil being torn. But you know what they did after that veil was torn is it was somebody's job to sew it back up. Because it's not that the veil was torn and they just left it torn. The veil was torn and, and the, the Jewish religious system said, get that thing closed back up. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Yep. Somebody, they either put up a new veil or, or sewed the one that was there back up. Which you think about what that that pictures. What are the chances that it would have torn is what they're asking. Yeah, exactly. The from, the top. from the top to the bottom. Yeah, and, and that that veil was a thick piece of <laughs> piece God of veil. That veil be absolutely. put back together. Yeah. During this I, time. Oh, I think I, they will absolutely. It's open for me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but they will absolutely have the veil when they have the, have the temple. So we've got one sacrifice down. One sacrifice, the high priest. He's ready to go. His sins have been atoned for. One animal's dead. Let's go to the second. The second sacrifice is for the people. After he's made the, the sacrifice for himself and his family, the priest exits the tabernacle. So he comes out wearing the special clothes, the special linen garments. He comes out, verse 7, and he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. And we're going to talk about the scapegoat in just a moment. We'll deal with that separately. But first, let's deal with the goat who is to die. Lots are cast. One goat, one goat's going to get it. The other goat is also going to get it, but kind of differently. Verse 15. Here's what happens to the goat who the lot for death falls. The, the one for the Lord. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil... And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement. Notice what he's making an atonement for here. Two things. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. So, he sh so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Meaning he's atoning for the sins of the people, but this second, this second goat also was used for the cleansing of the tabernacle itself. The shedding of blood for the cleansing of the tabernacle, which we'll, we're going we're gonna to put it together here with, with the other blood in just a moment. So he goes, this is his second trip inside the veil. In, in the same day, he goes in two times. The first time with the incense, the censer, the blood of the bull. Atones for himself, goes out, casts lots for the goat. The goat that is to die is slaughtered. The blood is caught, and he goes back into the veil. This time, he's going to, with his finger, he's going to make another sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat. This time, that blood is an atonement for... Not just the tabernacle, all the people. So now the nation of Israel, their sins have been atoned. <clears throat> Look at verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place. Until he come out and have made an atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. Can you think of any picture in it just being one man who's doing all of this? Just one man. Nobody else. Just one man is going to go in and he's going to make an atonement. So, the, 
The high priest has made atonement for himself, his family. He's made atonement for the people. He's cleansed the tabernacle. But he's still got a lot of blood left over. How much blood would it take if, if you dipped your finger in blood and sprinkled it seven times? <coughs> you still got a lot of blood left in that bowl, don't you? So what's he going to do with that? Do you just take it and dump it? No. No, no. You don't do that. Why? Because the, there's something special about the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So what does he do with the blood? There's a use for it. Look at verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord. Okay. This is the altar that's outside of the temple, the temple tent, or the tabernacle tent. This is in the courtyard. This is the burnt, the burnt offering altar, where they offer sheep and goats on a regular basis. He goes out to that, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So again, a ceremonial cleansing. He takes the blood and he's going to apply it. There were horn, four horns. That's one way in Israel, even today when they dig things up, you can always tell an Israelite altar because it has four horns. Okay? They would take the blood and they would apply it to those and he does more sprinkling with all of this. Again, all of it is symbolic. Does, does blood clean stuff real well? <laughs> no, it makes a, a terrible mess, doesn't it? But again, it's a picture. It's a picture. And he's, he's now used the blood. The blood is applied to ceremonially cleanse the altar of burnt offering in the courtyard of the tabernacle. But there's still another goat left. You remember, we, we had two goats. We have four animals total. We have a bull, two goats, and a ram. We've dealt with a bull and a goat. We've got one more, the scapegoat. Look at verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, okay, all of this is done. What time do you think it is? Some time has passed. I don't know how, how long it would take you to slaughter a bull and then slaughter a goat and do all of these things. Some time has passed. After, after he's done all of this, he shall bring the live goat. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. <laughs> it's a good thing they've got a lot of time, isn't it? How long would it take for you to confess all of your sins over the head of a goat? How about all the sins of our church? How about all the sins of our town? How about the whole nation of Israel? He's going, to, he's going to enumerate sins over the head of this goat. Putting them upon the head of the goat, and what? And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. You say, what? On earth is this talking about? And you know, as I was studying this, we don't understand exactly all of the pictures of this. There is a picture, and I'll bring it to you, but if you go online and you do a, do a search for, for what does the scapegoat mean, you will find lots of, of men who have written books on the scapegoat. But what you see right here, that's what we've got. What we have about the scapegoat is found right here. And there's not a big, long explanation with all of these intricate uh, applications for us. The word scapegoat means a removal or a departure. So upon this goat, this scapegoat, the sins of the children of Israel were, were ceremonially placed. And then it was taken by a fit man far from the camp out into the wilderness and there this goat was simply let go. In the time of Christ, uh, when, when they were celebrating the Day of Atonement, they still did the, state, the scapegoat, but there really wasn't much of a wilderness that they could take the goat to. So they would take it about 12 miles from the temple and they would push it off a cliff. There was a particular cliff that they would push this goat off of and it would die. Again, symbolic of taking away sin. Verse 22, the scapegoat shall bear upon him all their iniquities. 
And many have, again, attributed great significance and special meaning to every detail of the scapegoat. We simply don't have all of the significance that is on this act that was held uh, by the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and then again in the New. What do we know? Well, we know that this is a picture of Christ. But the thing is, is that Christ is going to be pictured in both of the goats. The one who, who is killed and the one who bears our sins away. And you'll see, I'm going to pull all of this together. Actually, Scripture will pull all of this together in just a moment. The end of the Day of Atonement comes in verse 23. We come to the end of a very long day, particularly for the high priest. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on him when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. These are the special clothes. Take those off, and he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place. And put on his garments and come forth. So he puts on the, the normal priest clothes. What we think of. The, it was white undergarments with a blue coat and <coughs> breastplate. And again, the kind of a big headdress. And come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people. And make atonement for himself and for the people. The blood has now been applied to the mercy seat within the Holy of Holies. The high priest removes these linen clothes. I, uh, I have slaughtered some animals in my time, and the clothes that I was wearing looked like I slaughtered an animal. What do you think would have happened? What would, have, what would this priest's clothes have looked like? He just killed a bull, and then he killed a goat, and then he's going to kill a ram. We'll see. It would have been, it would have been something. You, you can't do that without getting a little bit on you. Kind of interesting that a man in white clothing, stained only by blood. Any pictures there? <laughs> Absolutely. If you look forward, you see those. He's going to end the day with offering the ram as the burnt sacrifice. Verse 25. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. He's actually going to kind of pull everything together. And he that let go the goat for the scapegoat, that guy who, who took the goat out into the wilderness... He shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterwards come into the camp. He was considered to be defiled because he was leading this goat that was defiled. And so it, it was kind of a, a guilt by association. Verse 25. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp and shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their dung, he that burneth them shall wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. We started this day with four animals. The bull was offered for the sins of the high priest. The, the goat who got the lot for the Lord, was he was killed. His blood was put as an atonement for the people and also for the tabernacle. The scapegoat was led away into the wilderness, and it would never be seen again. And the ram is offered as a burnt offering. But what do we do with the bodies of the bull and the first goat? Well, they're taken outside of the camp where they will be burnt in totality. And the person who does so will wash himself and then come in. So at the end of the day, everything's clean. Everything's been dealt with. There's not, there aren't corpses lying around. The blood has been used for its purpose. You would know that it had been there. If you looked at the, at the altar, you'd say, boy, the, the altar's got blood all over it. it. It's supposed to. If you looked at the priest before he was able to change his clothing, he'd have blood all over him too. But the mercy seat, they never clean that. It just always, that's the presence of God. Yep. Be... You would think, I have always had this thought. When you, if you applied blood for let's say 100 years, and it just kind of builds up, you'd think it would get thick. If you read in, in Jewish lore, you find that they believed that the blood would be, would be taken away, the divine, that it was kind of miraculous, that it would be cleaned away. But we don't have that recorded for us in Scripture, but it is something to wonder, wonder about. Was there ever a time when they would go in and <laughs> scrape the blood off? Not of, the, not of the Ark of the Covenant. But how did it look? Well, nobody really got to look at it for, for long. So, really, the only person who would see the Ark of the Covenant would be the priest. And he was seeing it 
kind of with watery eyes and a lot of smoke because he was putting the, the incense in the censer to call smoke so that he couldn't look directly at the, the mercy seat. Is the mercy seat is part of the ark? I, I guess I'm not understanding. It is. The mercy seat is the part, it's the lid of the ark of the covenant. The, on the lid of the ark of the covenant, there are two cherubim, and their wings reach, and they, they touch in the middle. Just below that, that's called the mercy seat. Yep, and so that's where he would apply the blood. So, wow. Yep. A lot of, lot of hoopla, isn't it? Now, come with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to, Scripture puts the, I was thinking, how could I, how can I pull all of this together? I can't do it nearly as well as God can, so let's just turn to Hebrews 10. This is shouting ground that we're on right here in Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, that's what we've been saying this whole time. You, we say, do you see what it's picturing? Yeah, I see what it's picturing. It's not the good thing to come, but it pictures it. It says... For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never make those sacri can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. What's it say? <clears throat> These sacrifices, they were a picture, but they didn't take away sin. They, they, they were picturing the removal of sin, but they didn't actually take away sin. Verse 2. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? <laughs> if they could actually take away sin, you wouldn't have to do it every year. But the Day of Atonement is an annual thing that the high priest would do. Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But in, these, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sin every year. Verse 4. This is, this is the key. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. They, the, the blood, think of it, all of the hundreds of, and thousands of bulls and goats over the years who died, whose blood was shed and carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled on the mercy seat, all of that did not take away the very first sin. It didn't take away one. He goes on. Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, this is talking about Christ, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering... And burnt offering, and offering for sin, thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure in them, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus comes, and he's going he's gonna to fix all of this. Look at what it says, verse 10. By the which will... We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What's it say? Once for all. Once for all. We don't need another. We don't have to have a high priest who goes through this whole ordeal every year where he does all this. We have the body of Christ. He goes on in verse 11. He says, and every priest standeth daily. Ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Christ, but this man, after, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus accomplished in one day on a hill outside of Jerusalem... You see the picture there. Outside the city, he died on a hill, and he accomplished what all of the hundreds of animals, thousands of animals that had been <clears throat> slaughtered over the years, Christ was the fulfillment of every picture. And Jesus didn't just atone or cover our sins. 
He's our Redeemer. He took them away. He's not just, he, again, the goats, the, one, the one's blood atoned and the other took the sins away. Jesus did both. His, his blood took sins away for all time. Jesus is not only our sacrifice, but Hebrews 14, 15 tells us he's also our high priest. Jesus is everything in the story. He's the, he's the sacrifice. He's the high priest. He's also God. Jesus is everything here. He declared it is finished when he died outside the city and when he gave up the ghost. And when he did, as we were talking about earlier, the veil was torn. Why was the veil torn? Well, it opened our access into the presence of God. And we can go anytime. Promises are made to those who will accept this promise. I'm going to read. I know I've read quite a bit here this evening. Look with me at Hebrews 10:17. This is tremendous. Because of what Jesus did, he says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Again, we're not talking about just a covering. We're talking about a complete removal. Having therefore, because of what Jesus has done, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Are you seeing all of the parallels here? He says, verse 23, Let us hold fast the profession of, faith, of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. What Aaron did once a year with fear and trepidation. Could you imagine Aaron as he goes through the veil the first time? Holding his censer and his incense and this bowl of blood. Can you imagine the, the, the trembling, the trepidation that he would do that with? What Aaron did once a year... With fear and trembling, I am boldly invited, even commanded to do without ceasing. I'm commanded by God to pray without ceasing. <laughs> Imagine if you walked up to Aaron and said, hey, Aaron, I just want you to just keep going into the Holy of Holies. He just said, oh no, oh no, I'm not doing that. I do that once a year. I do it twice on one day, but I... That's, that's enough for me. I don't think my heart can handle much more. And I do it all the time. I go into the Holy of Holies constantly. I go by myself. I go with others. It's a tremendous thing. All because of Christ. The Day of Atonement pictured the greatest act of love and sacrifice in all of eternity. And while we don't celebrate the Day of Atonement, we don't celebrate Yom Kippur, we should certainly remember and be thankful for all that is ours in Christ. Jesus, all the pictures, put them all together, and he, he perfects them. And we can go into the presence of God.